I want to welcome everybody to our fall session of the Lay School of Theology. I'm Wilson Dickinson. Uh, I direct the Doctor of Ministry in Continuing Education Programs at LTS. And I am excited for a, a great class session here today. Um, first, I want to start off say that we're actually doing a, a small shift in how we hold the Lay School of Theology. We are bringing classes now into the churches, um, holding this at a time, hopefully where this works for individuals, but also works for congregations. And we're also hoping that these sessions could be a bridge for folks who might be interested in auditing our online courses. And so today is one of those examples. That this, this course is also going to be offered in November. So if you would like to look to explore this in more depth, um, you can you can do that. And I'll give some information at the end and in an email after this about that. Um, but first, I want to introduce our teacher. Uh, Reverend Dr. Francisca Nutzeleze. I hope, th did I get that right? I should have checked for him, I'm sorry. Um, she is a pastoral theologian and, and pastoral care, care practitioner who fulfills her calling by engaging the academy, the church, and the needs of the world. She's held teaching positions in the United States, in Europe, in Australia, and her main teaching areas are pastoral theology, spiritual formation, pastoral care, and trauma care. As a scholar, activist, and clergywoman, uh, Dr. Nutzeleze is committed to the organic integration of theory and praxis, justice, and faith. Uh, the focus of her research and writing is the state of trauma that is being experienced by both humans and the planet and the ways that these intersect due to the convergence of socioeconomic factors, political and environmental forces. In her upcoming book, The World as a Trauma Zone, she draws from her work with victims of sex trafficking, as well as the experience of dislocated communities, in order to offer an assessment of the state of the world, which she argues is, quote, deeply traumatized and dehumanized and in need of an urgent pastoral theological response. Dr. Nutzeleze has previously published the book, Just Care, Pastoral Counseling with Socioeconomically Vulnerable Women, along with many other articles and essays. Um, as, as came up before we started here, uh, Dr. Nutzeleze teaches pastoral theology and care at LTS. And I, I heard rave reviews from her class this past June, all kinds of DMIN students were coming up to me and just giving me nuggets from the class and just talking about how powerful it had been for them. Um, and so if you would like, to get to get to experience more of her as a teacher. Again, she's gonna be <laughs> offering the class. It's a, a fuller version of what we'll get to sample today in November. So without further ado, I hand it over. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wow, thank you for um, allowing me to share a little bit uh, in this time of uh, some of my uh, explorations on this topic, which, um, as you will um, see, uh, I will be very honest, is still in development. I was um, handed a course that used to be taught by another colleague, Dr. Koble, and uh, I was given the same title and the same syllabus to potentially use with a very short notice by Dr. Martel. And... Um, I actually took it as a, an important moment of um, my own professional and spiritual development, to be honest. I took it as an opportunity to say, yes, I've been exploring these topics, but always from the perspective mostly of a pastoral care theologian that expands the lens to the interconnection of people and systems and people and places and people embedded, obviously, in the web of life, you know, which is beyond just human life. But I don't think I had taken it quite seriously, at least academically, in terms of conversations and collaborations. And so I say all of this to also introduce my friend and colleague present here tonight, which is Elaine Nogueira Gozzi, who has been my colleague at, at MTSO. We started together at the Methodist Theological Seminary a few years ago. And um, she was bringing this, the second part, the climate change part, to uh, uh, to the seminary as her ex expertise. And I was going 
uh, as a, the professor of pastoral theology and care. And um, I have to say that the friendship, the collaboration, and the being on the campus at that particular historic time where they were launching this new master in uh, social justice and looking at ecology um, allowed me to also take more seriously my own call to expand my vision. And so what I want to do today, since we have a little time, is to actually highlight a little bit the process that takes me to this topic. Because to be fully honest, this is where I'm at in the process. Like I have not fully reconceived the course to make it my own. And uh, I'm working on it. And so I didn't want to be fake, you know, and present you something like just whip it up for this hour, not fully owning it. So what I thought I would do is an organic, since we use this language a lot, right, in, <laughs> in this subject, you know, just use this space to be organically engaged with you in the conversation and to also let you see how a pastoral theologian thinks about these things, where we begin, you know, because it's a different starting point uh, than, than, than the systematic theologian, the, eco the, eco uh, the ecological theologian, I don't know, the eco, the, 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 and the ethicists, you know, we all have different starting points. So I thought this could give you a taste a little bit also how I think in case you want to take the course, because um, that will be very much uh, the imprint that I will give to the course. So um, I'm going to um, share, sorry, not sharing the PowerPoint yet until I have shared the screen. So uh, beginning with the title, I, um, I called it a conversation, <laughs> not a presentation, it's not a lecture, but it's really a conversation. And I really would love to invite this, this amazing group of people who's here, either because you know a lot or even more than me, or because you want to learn something new and we can do that better in dialogue and in conversation. And uh, um, also because this is the way I like to teach, which is in conversation. And those of you who have been in my classes will know that it's true. <laughs> That's how I do it. So I called it the eco care. And I thought this is, this, this sits well with me. I want, I want to, to start using that, that term. I looked it up on Google to see who else uses it. And it has to do with incredibly non-related things, neither to theology nor to pastoral care. So I'll have to be careful how that plays out in the future if I ever write anything <laughs> with that title. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and in the title, I really tried to think, what is in this for me? So it's, it's care for the ecosystem, you know, of people and people and where they live and in conversation with the system in which they live. Um, so the very first thing I do always, especially when I don't know my audience, is to imagine what do I want to deliver, you know? So I wanted to be clear for those of who you showed up maybe thinking that I was going to give something and they'll come out disappointed. I just wanted to clarify what are my objectives for tonight. So I will not have an in-depth conversation about food justice, uh, eco the ecological crisis, but more, it's like the meta conversation, you know, what comes before we even get into the nitty gritty, like what, what, what is the stake, for instance, you know, how do I define the topic and what is the context out of, at, from, from which I come to this topic, you know, as a teacher, as a Christian, as a, uh, you know, as a person who in this moment is a pastor at a church, you know, so it's like, how do I educate my, my own congregation from the little things that I see are not right in the way we do things in our building, you know, like how we recycle or not, how we take care of the of the building in certain ways. And so now I'm I'm thinking constantly about this topic in in the practice of every um, um, every form of of care that I inhabit and I practice. So. Who are the state? What are the stakes? And who are the stakeholders in this conversation? It feels very important to me to clarify that and uh, then engage you in thoughts, interests, and then raise construct 
constructive questions with you that I could possibly pick up in my course. You know, if you have questions that you with which you come to this conversation tonight, especially if I don't get to them, I would love to have them and they would help me, you know, put a section in my course where I try to address them. Because if you have them, somebody else will have them too. That's always what I, what I think. You know, you're, you're a representation of the, of the, of the classroom in some way. You are my classroom today. So welcome. And I'd like to, tr to, to start, first of all, with actually bringing you into the conversation with your full self, which is also another important characteristic of my teaching. It's like, what brings you here tonight? It's really important for me to know, but more important for you to know. Um, I just drew a few potential answers. I want to learn something new because this is a hot topic. Well, some of us know it's a hot topic. It's, it, it's, it's so burning. It's going to burn us down, literally, you know, using a bit of a play on the word. But others are so far from understanding that this is an important topic that they need to be persuaded that it is. I read that a lot in the literature, right? You know, that people are not quite convinced, especially Christians, especially evangelical Christians. And that um, it's very concerning, but that's why we need education, right? And um, um, raising of awareness on these topics. Um, you might be here because you're concerned about climate change and the impact it has on human life and not only and beyond. Um, maybe you know a lot. I know a couple of you who know a lot, much more than me probably, about this topic, and you wish to engage others in dialogue. This is a great space, you know, when you have a lot of knowledge to actually contribute to conversations like this. Somebody is not muted. Would you please make sure that you're muted so that um, we keep the noise down? Um, oh, you might be thinking, I want to know how to better live and be a caring pastor in this time and age. And that for sure includes a conversation about what's happening to our climate um, and uh, how we're being impacted by the, the shifts um, in the seasons and, 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 and the natural disasters that are occurring all over the planet. Or you might be feel, feeling compelled to act and advocate on behalf of those who are suffering the most because of the ecological crisis. That's already a deeper um, stance, right, uh, that some of us might have. It means that we're already making the connection, that we already have a, a, a certain amount of knowledge that the ecological crisis has the worst impact on the poorest and the most vulnerable in, on the earth already. So ha if you have a calling to care for these particular populations, then you'll know that um, it is absolutely imperative to learn more about how to um, intervene how to begin to act differently and uh, to advocate differently. Um, so I really wanted to take a minute and uh, to have each one of us to say um, just one word about why you're here. It, it, literally one word. It could be just, I'm here because I care. I'm here because I want to act. I want to learn. and uh, And that brings us fully into the conversation, not just as bystanders or like observers, but not involved. Um, so I really want to do that. If you can unmute your microphone for a second and just show up and say who you are and why you're here, that would be really helpful. Um, maybe I'll call on a person and then you, after you say, it, you can call on uh, somebody else that you see on the screen. I'll call on Elaine. Well, I'm here to um, to support my friend Francesca Nuzolesi, who is teaching the class and who invited me to be here. <laughs> but beyond that, um, this is a topic that is very um important to me and uh, bringing pastoral care and climate change together, I think it's it's really the center of the conversation. 
because talking about climate change, sometimes people might think that is through science or maybe making people feel afraid of what is coming up. But talking about climate change through thinking in the ways of collaborating, caring for one and caring for others, by bringing hope and developing community, for me, is the most effective way of demonstrating what Christianity has to offer in our current reality. So thank you for the lecture. Thank you for the class. Thank you, Elaine. Would you call on somebody? Sure. I'm going to call on Nancy. <laughs> Um, I'm Nancy Cuppersmith, and I am here because I uh, want to teach. And I'm going to call on Chuck uh, Wegman. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. I'm here because I care about this issue and because I believe it's so critical. There's a quote that I heard uh, that rivets it uh, in my mind. Someone said that we're the first generation to experience climate change and we're the last generation that's gonna be able to do anything about it. To me, that just highlights the importance of, of this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Welcome. Call a name. Um, maybe you missed it. Um, let's go for Linda. Oh, sorry. Oh. Oh, <laughs> That's <Chris>? okay. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Um, I belong to a church, and we're having a crop walk with the uh, Church World Service coming up. And one of the promos for that stated that the people that are affected mostly by uh, climate change are the ones that do the least bit to cause it, but it affects them greatly. So I want to learn more about that and be a proponent for this um, uh, understanding and trying to do something about it. So if when people can test what I'm saying, I can have a little more knowledge to help them and to help myself and the cause. Oh, I'm from Columbus, Ohio. Thank you, Linda. You are welcome. I will call on Al Joyner. Al, are you with us? You need to unmute yourself. There it is. Hello. Um, I'm from Pikeville, North Carolina, and I'm here because I want to learn more and hear uh, the thoughts that you all have this evening on the subject. Thank you, Al. I'm here with Sherry. Sherry, are you with us? Yes, ma'am. Hello. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm here uh, because I got the invite. Um, so I just I want to learn more and see what it's all about. Um, and in any way that I can be helpful or, or help out or do whatever, I'm here for that. Thank you. Sure thing. Um, and I'll call on Aunt Barbara. I don't think uh, Sister Barbara is one of our members. She's actually is on. She is 94, <laughs> I think, 94 years old. 
and she's on with us tonight. So she she may not unmute, but I'll go ahead on and 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 say why I'm here. Uh, I'm here because this topic is very important to me, and uh, I want to do whatever I can to uh, uh, fight um, the injustices uh, that uh, we face uh, with uh, food inequities, uh, climate change, and and all of those things. So I'm here because I want to act, and uh, so I'm here. My wife is here, and my daughter is here. So. I'll let them say, and then I'll call on somebody else. Hello, everybody. I am here because my husband invited me. He thought it was important for us to be here um, to hear this good information. So I'm here to learn. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, I'm Anaya. I'm here because my dad invited me. <laughs> All right. Good job, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we got a lot of folks here tonight, so I'm glad that the, the church is on tonight. So I'll call on Mary Washington. Okay, I'm I'm just like Anaya and a few others. I'm because our pastor asked us to get on, so we're gonna get on and see what it's what it's like, see what we need to do. Great. I see a lot of uh, telephone numbers without names, so it might be hard to call on all of you. Um, if How about we proceed like this? If you would like to say what you're here for and you haven't been called on, you can raise your hand, put it in the chat. I, it's it's really important I was thinking not just for me but also for you to name that you know because usually when we know what we are in for we begin to claim the stakes are you here because you think something urgent needs to be done or it's just kind of you know it's a lot of things going on in the world let's see what else is going on Frederick Fred Nelson please yes thank you uh I'm from uh, the First Christian Church in Alexandria, Virginia. We're initiating climate-focused outreach projects uh, uh, at this time. And so at this, at this point, we want to raise awareness um, amongst mm -hmm. uh, the various members of the congregation and the community about the issues. So we want to understand those issues, uh, how individually we can be better uh, persons or pastors in that area and to understand the impacts it's having on other people and how we can be advocates for policy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else? I have a comment here. I'm going to read it. Um, it's from Don and I think it's John, right? Barnes, I hope you recognize you. Hi, dear. It's important to connect topics like pastoral care and climate care that are many times separated in the academy. So, yeah. Okay. Anyone else would like to express why they're here? You can unmute yourself and do it, or I can proceed. I know sometimes it's always... Uh, a juggle, you know, how we use the time to honor who is here and also to maximize the, the teaching and the sharing. So I have one minute, whoever you are, if you want to say, go Esther, go. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I echo everything that was said. Like, I think it's such an urgent uh, thing for all of us to respond, to learn how to care for the the world that we are all part of and also to think about in a pastoral care. So I am here to learn how to do that myself too from all of you. And also another reason why I'm here is because of my colleague, Dr. Francesca Nuzales, mm -hmm. because I have very few interaction with you, but in all those moments, I was just so blessed. And when I saw your name that you were doing this, I 
yeah, I had to be here and had this opportunity to just learn from you. And so I am here because of you oh, too. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, friends. Um, I don't want to belabor the point, but I I'd, I'd really need to say how important it is to to call on each other you know for in this kind of spaces you know like and to to be witnesses together of why we we come to things like this these are not popular topics in my <laughs> experience you know these are not especially pastoral care i'll start from there the pastoral care is not the field that attracts the faint of heart <laughs> because usually people run the opposite way when there is suffering and uh here with this topic in particular, you know, it's like we are enlarging the focus to something of, of such large proportions and entering the field, even I feel the fear and trembling, you know, in approaching this, we, we are expanding the focus from the person to person, to the system, to the global, that includes non-human realities and creatures and dynamics you know so for anybody who takes these things seriously it can be very overwhelming and so to just create partnership and collaborations and dialogues and uh, even just companions on the journey is um, it's a very needed thing and it's also um, it's just encouraging and inspiring so here let me go back to the to the PowerPoint. Um, let me let me continue. Thank you, thank you for uh, um, for sharing with me what brings you here. I'm going to begin with what brings um, a pastoral theologian into this conversation. As I said, I want to just kind of bring you along on my journey. In the beginning, in the beginning has uh, you know many possibilities. We could go straight into the scriptures or the creation story, but I'm not going to do. Um, you know, an exegesis of the text to convince you uh, that uh, the care of the earth is part of our responsibility, is part of our gift uh, to be stewards, um, which has been misunderstood in many ways. And I'm not a biblical scholar, so I'm not going to get into that um, um, dangerous territory. But um, practical theologians begin with the Bible as well. So, you know, we bring the biblical perspective to the act of care, and that includes always people in systems, people in, um, in, in, from the perspective of God. So theological anthropology is another perspective that we, that we borrow from or we, we draw from. And then the human sciences, of course, you know, psychology, um, um, sociology, political theory, you know, anything that helps us understand why suffering is what it is, you know, for individuals and communities. And now, colleagues, very my very esteemed colleagues in the field of pastoral care and counseling have added the ecological perspective. So this is a new movement. It's not prolific, you know, with lots of books and things, but uh, we're talking about... Uh, uh, Larry Graham, you know, teaching at Iliff School of Theology, writing a book about caring for people, caring for systems, which included an ecosystemic map. I remember when I was a student 25 years ago, you know, so these conversations have started in the margins of the field of pastoral theology and care, but have now in these times, in the past 10 years, maybe 15, become a lot more um, rich and robust. And um, so what, what, has, uh, what has helped us um, um, move in that direction is also move the focus. So we begin in the field of pastoral theology, again, we begin with attention, the care of souls was what we concentrated on. And there was a time many, many centuries ago where the soul was understood as the primary concern or the pastor or the priest. And uh, and, and the soul was really um, distinct, and, and it is still as an entity, 
but it was understood as a particular concern really detached from the body, actually put in, in, in contrast with the body, first of all, and then the body contrasted with other created beings and with plants and everything had an hierarchy um, that has we've had to overcome through the centuries in order to get to where we are today. And that is, I think, one of the problems with some groups of Christians or evangelicals that still don't see the connection is because there is an understanding, an old and traditional and with its own value, uh, understanding that the, the church is supposed to care for people's souls. You know, we have to be involved in caring for, you know, we have to um, be concerned about what happens to our our spiritual life um, detached from, and we promise that it will be better in the next life where there will be new heavens and new earth. So we don't have to be concerned about what's happening to this earth and to this uh, planet on which we walk. I think this, to me, is important to go historically into this process to see where the problem could be in some denominations, in some groups, and, and not just among Christians, also in the larger society, to see where, where, where is the hiccup? You know, why have we not been doing this before, first of all? And why are we still reticent or skeptical about creating the synergy and the connection right now? So from the ancient practice of the care of the soul, we moved the focus through the medieval time and, you know, a lot of um, the pastoral care done through the centuries, um, even before the Protestant Reformation, was, had a focus on the family and the community. And, um, and then with the, you know, with the Enlightenment, the, the focus moved on the self. It became even more, it was not the soul, the spiritual, mystical side, but the self as the entity of the thinking mind, the personhood of the um, of the human being with the advent of psychology. We have, you know, so focused on the human being. We have become so much more anthropocentric than we ever were that the, the, although technology and advancement in uh, knowledge of, of the functioning of the world has contributed so much to the formation of the self and the understanding of the self in context, we have not moved as fast and as um, in, in, a com in a committed way towards seeing the correlation with the, the, the deterioration of the self um, with the more technological advancements. So, you know, instead of, of, of looking at what are the consequences of all this advancement, we have been concerned that the self was um, was losing something, you know, relationships were suffering. Uh, there was more the rise of anxiety and depression because the self, surrounded by so much power um, and and, uh, and and growing power through technology, um, had not the capacity then to have limits and boundaries, which are needed for us to be uh, healthy, to function well. So then the, the, the focus moved on systems and we, we started to look more at the interconnectedness until one of our colleagues um, from, from Vanderbilt, um, I can't, her name is not coming to me, um, came up with the, with, the, with the idea that we have to look at the living human web. And that was a big development. But the focus on the ecosystem the importance of looking at the environment with, with, within which all of these parts coexist and have to thrive has been the work of scholars from the global south, the marginalized communities, the ones who have had the impact of the consequences of the ecological crisis have been our saving grace. You know, the people who have brought attention to, because maybe they are the ones outside of the of the of the Western world who live more closely still uh, with with the land, with the earth, and 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 so they they also receive the the greatness of that, you know, the gifts of that, but also the consequences of when things don't go right or begin to go very wrong, um, like the consequences of extreme climate climate change. So 
I'm taking this as the current stance, like evangelical, the, the evangelical initiative on climate change has come up with these four claims. This is part of an article that uh, Elaine actually kindly shared with me, but I know the work of uh, Storm Swain. She's my colleague from uh, New Zealand, who is part of the of my guild, the Guild of uh, Society of Pastoral Theology. And uh, she's written this article called Climate Change and Pastoral Theology, where she kind of summarizes the state of things. And I thought this would be good for us to, 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 to review together. Like, what are we coming to agree upon? Um, is the human-induced climate change is real? So we're not debating that anymore. We're accepting that as a reality. The consequences of climate change will be significant and will hit the poor the hardest. Christian moral convictions demand our responses to the climate change problem. This is where we become the stakeholders. And the need to act now is urgent. Government, businesses, churches, and individuals are all have a role to play in addressing climate change starting now. Sorry for the misspelling of that quote. Government, businesses, churches, and individuals all have a role to play in addressing climate change starting now. So let's say this is where we start now. This is where pastoral theologians are coming together to want to act, to want to work together, um, to collaborate with uh, scientists and uh, to debunk all the idea that the human being um, is the only concern, the self is the only concern, or the human systems are the only and primary concern of, um, of, of the pastoral care field or the practical theological field in praxis. And, um, and, that's, and that's an important place where I also would like to stop right now for a second and just engage you. Like, what, what, what do you think? Can you stand with these claims? Like, are you all on the same page on these things? Is there anything we can comment together? Like, is there anything that, that calls on you more, that causes you to reflect? Are you persuaded of the first claim, for instance, um, or the second or the third, which calls on me in particular, that there's a Christian moral conviction that demands that our responses to climate change problem are, are necessary. You know, it's because we are Christians and we come to this from, from, from that stance, um, that there is no playing around with politics. Because some of the, of the right critiques that come to this is that this is not so much a mistrust of what the science or the evidence of our own experience uh, tells us, but it's that particularly in the US, this topic has become very politicized. And so now it's more a matter of politics than actual knowledge of, of science. And so some of us might be caught in that debate and in that dilemma and cannot see clearly from a moral, ethical, Christian standpoint how important it is to approach this this not the issue, but the, the the action, you know, toward doing something and 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 collaborating more and learning more from the experts on on what is happening to our climate and uh, and I will talk after we have a few minutes of conversation more in particular about how this impacts the field of pastoral care. Like, what do we have to deal with as pastor or as theologians or as educators in, uh, in, in, in the world right now? Um, but I just want to pause it for a second and give the opportunity. I don't know if there is any hand raised, anybody that would, would you like to, would you please unmute yourself and just, just respond to any of these claims? Like, do they make sense to you? Do you think this is a good place to begin um, like, would you sign on this manifesto and say, you know, this, this is, this is, we, we can all agree that this is where we need to begin where, if we are in, a, at least in a Christian group or church or a theological education field or. Uh, 
I I definitely agree with the current stance. Um, I said that education was one of the things that I was interested in, and it's because I'm um, part of a what is called a green chalice team um, at, at our church, and uh, we definitely are a congregation of what we would call purple. And I feel as though some um, people in the congregation get very upset when um, any of this, any of the need to be a Christian to others is, is brought up because they don't believe in climate change in the first place. Thank you. See, Michael, yes, you have your hand raised, please. Um, okay, I want to respond to claim number two. Um, and I was just going to say that I think that it's important that we take notice of that claim because a lot of the time with the way that modern churches are structured, um, people in leadership positions in church um, start to ignore the poor people um, that are like below them or like living below um, their status because they've built up their life to something a little bit um, more affluent. And so sometimes the church can tend to forget about those people um, because they get detached from it. And so I think that this is something that we should bring up a little bit more often, just about the, the reality of situations like claim number two. Thank you. I would also like to respond to claim number four. And I guess because I'm, I'm a little bit further in this uh, in this fight right now, um, we've been doing a series on this and that. Uh, I think our last uh, sermon was uh, um, no more talking. Uh, it's time for action. Um, and uh, I'm reading this book. It's uh, the 2016 Hunger Report. I don't know if you all have, have seen it. It's uh, the nourishing effect and it talks about ending hunger, improving health and reducing inequality. And basically just a, a real quick thing that really stands out, it, it goes by a uh, man's low hierarchy of needs. And so when we look at the basic need, uh, we're, when we're dealing with that bottom level of, of just food and water, um, that's that's the thing that we're dealing with. So we can't even get off of the the first level uh, for people to feel safe, and and it, and it deals with uh, the mental effects that children have, and it and it gives some breakdown. A lot of statistics in this book, and a lot of research that's been done, and how over the uh, the life of a child, what happens to someone that is poor and had um, uh, um, a rough upbringing. Uh, due to being malnutrition or not uh, getting the, the type of food that they need uh, due to situations like climate change and everything like that. So I think uh, number four is very, very critical that um, the more that we wait, I um, think Kentucky says one out of five children uh, experiences uh, hunger in Kentucky. So one out of five, I mean, we cannot waste any more time. So I'll, I'll put the uh, the name of it in the, in in the text. I just seen somebody ask for it, so I'll, I'll put. Thank that. you, thank you, Michael. Yes, that would be really great. Yeah, sharing resources is one of the great things about being in conversation with each other. Yeah. Um, I agree with e each of the claims, claims one through four, but I think as somebody uh, kind of new coming in and wanting to make a difference. It can be overwhelming for some people because there's so much to do. And sometimes when there's so much to do, you just kind of freeze and you don't know where to start. So I think this is this is a good place to start with this this um, presentation. Mm. 
Thank you. Yeah, we have to have to avoid bringing people into the state of being overwhelmed, which, as you said, paralyzes. That is the impact of trauma, right? And Wilson read it in my bio. I think the world is a traumatized in a traumatized state. And so we tend to do that a lot as human beings, even in the face of this big evidence, one of the, you know, like climate change, that it's undeniable from the perspective of some, what is one of the responses to trauma is um, denial. <laughs> you know, it's just like, no, it's not happening. I'm going to go have a beer because, you know, whatever, you know, it's, it's too hot and I need to cool down and not to make the connection about this, this, this is part of the crisis we're living in. So, um, yeah, thank you for naming that. I'm very, always very mindful of how even education and raising awareness can leave people more disempowered. And uh, that's why we have to do it cautiously and uh, caringly. That's why pastoral care becomes so important and that professionals of care get involved in this because there's a lot of anxiety that also this conversation brings for people. Anybody else would like to respond? I cannot see the chat, Wilson. I don't can, know. I, can I share a couple comments from the chat? Yes, please. I can't open it from my perspective. Chuck shares, I agree with every claim. I think of congregations understand these, especially number three. I didn't appreciate why ministers speak of climate change. And then Linda shares, we are all in this together. We are all stakeholders, whether we realize it or not. Thank you. Okay, so I'd say the reason, you know, I share this besides, you know, being a good starting point, this is kind of new manifesto for pastoral theologians. And uh, it's one of the reasons it gives me, you know, a commitment to want to engage in this conversation as hard as it is. Um, it's also to give us an opportunity to see where we are. You know, some some of you, as Michael stated, you know, you're way deep into action and urgency is already hit home, you know, others may still be in the face of like, hmm, let me see if I really believe that, you know, what evidence do I have? Uh, what do I need to be to do to be persuaded? You know, do I need to take a course? Do I need to immerse myself into a book? Or uh, um, speaking of which, I really wanted to name this because I, I, I really believe that education, obviously, because of what I do, and uh, sharing um, stories and information can really um, change people you know we are in that kind of faith tradition where you know stories impact us and change our lives um during the pandemic i got stuck in the netherlands and um i was literally in a country with no language um but i didn't understand the language and i didn't know anybody and i got literally stuck there for a good chunk of of the pandemic the good first year and I had brought with me only a few books from the U.S. because I didn't know how long I was going to stay. And then I got stuck. And one of them was called Nature and the Human Soul. And this was a book by Bill Plotkin, who I don't know if any of you knows him, but he, he used to be a psychologist, psychotherapist that uh, turned a new leaf, went to the desert um, in uh, Arizona and uh, started leading groups into the quest, you know, for uh, a restart of, of, of uh, human development by connecting with nature. And it's written, like, it is written like a new developmental psychology, like a book that re-envisions human development as if we could redo it, imagines if we could redo it by being connected to nature at every stage of life. And the transformation that that would cause, it's, it's like cosmic value. And that book was a tome like this, but I had all the time in the world to read it, really 
changed my whole understanding of my field and what I'm here to do on this earth in this time and age. And so that's to the power of people who have really journeyed a different journey, you know, from the head to the earth. He says, not to the head, to the heart, but to the earth and to come out of it again, a new creature that understands life in a completely different way. I find it spiritually like revolutionary and uh, a great gift. If you're interested, I can put it in the chat as well. So the, 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 there is something beautiful that Howard Kleinbell, who is one of my colleagues and uh, um, great pioneer in, in many areas of pastoral theology, that he, he, he wrote the book Ecotherapy many years ago. And he says the most important thing is to begin with a story. And so what is your story or connection to nature and to the earth? Where, that, that's where we need to begin to re-envision um, what, what, what is the journey toward healing and wholeness, uh, not just for us, but for our relationship with the whole that contains us. So that, that, that was my attempt, you know, with, with this to, to just give us an opportunity to touch base with, with, uh, with our belief system and where we are on the journey. So moving forward with where I am in my own journey and where I want to do in the class is to develop a pastoral theological perspective that includes what is happening to the earth, climate change, food justice, all related to that, and how we care for people and the earth. So eco-care in and with within the ecosystem. We develop a, a, a pastoral theological perspective beginning to connect care of persons and care of the planet. Now, this it's like, duh, we've been saying this forever. But that's not happened. It's not happened directly. It, it's not happened in the literature. Not many books are written this way. It's not taught in the 101 pastoral care courses, you know. And sometimes seminary seminaries give only one course. You know, in the curriculum now that has been shrunk, you know, there's only one course in pastoral care. And we have so many pathologies dealing with human beings alone, how do we add the lens of ecology, you know? So to me, it's this shifting the lens and saying there is no care of persons without care of the planet. So this doesn't become like a second course or, a, or, or, or a, something additional, something to do later, but something that comes um, as urgent and essential to the teaching of the field. And um, so with that comes the honoring of the contribution and the perspectives of the most vulnerable. Well, these pastoral theologians have been doing this for, for, for a while now, listening to the voices not of the poor, but all the voices that were not included in academic circles for, 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 for centuries. And collecting stories, which is the task of pastoral care, collecting the experience of living human documents and embedding them into a living ecological web. So seeing the interconnection between the two, which comes natural to people who come from these spaces, by the way. I think we in the Western world have to make the leap, but people that come from different um, uh, living realities think automatically, I, I, I think as, as like the most obvious, um, our brothers and sisters, the natives of our country, you know, they, they just think, naturally that way we have to make the leap sometimes to connect um as if you know going apple picking is the activity of the fall you know instead of <laughs> reconnecting in a way that this is the essence of how we can sustain ourselves you know is to reconnect to what gives the source of life in some ways um and then creating a healthy dialogue be between professional care practitioners and the scientific community. And uh, again, this has been happening, for instance, in the field of trauma. You know, we listen to neuroscientists. We know new things about how the brain develops and, and responds to traumatic effect. Are we ready to enlarge the lens to see how 
weather change impacts, you know, human beings and uh, uh, how anxiety grows in the spaces where there is food um, uncertainty constantly. And um, it doesn't take a PhD in psychology to know that. But how do we move constructively where these conversations are not just done in academia, you know, but trickle into the church and into the spaces in which we live and practice life and faith on a daily basis. So I'm going to look at the, the clock here. We don't have much time. So I wanted to name, okay, the obvious, what is the stake in a general way? The health of the planet, the health of humans and communities, the survival of many species, including our own, the care of our earth, our ethical and moral responsibility is part of the biblical mandate and as Christians, we're called to be stewards, partners, um, good collaborators and friends of the earth. And uh, the gospel mandate to care for the most vulnerable in our midst. And the most vulnerable happen to be then the ones who have the impact of the climate change more strongly upon them. So that's kind of a, the, you know the general picture. But what's at stake in particular for pastors? And I don't mean only professional pastors and pastoral caregivers, but each one of us who's called to care, let's say, even as a lay person. We have an alarming race of eco-anxiety among teenagers. That's what I've registered as a psychotherapist, besides being a professor. The, the fear that kids have now of the future to the point that they don't want to live. That that's what I receive from parents and families, that what's the point? What's the point if we're going to be burned, you know, in 50 years and the earth is not going to exist? So the, 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 the information has to be handled with care, as we said, because it can create a lot of fear. And fear can be paralyzing and can be disastrous for kids in their development. And we've seen that in particular with COVID, you know, what that kind of shock, how it's impacted the, the young people and the suffering that we see in suicide, in, in, in the race also of suicide, suicidality of young people and of old ages, actually. Violence grows because, as Michael said, on the bottom of the scale, when people don't have food, but people don't have, have extreme heat, and people uh, don't have the basics to, to live. They're not thinking about self-actualization and how they're going to save their souls. They're thinking about how to survive. And survival, unfortunately, brings us back to our primal instincts, which as human beings, depending on what's your take on human nature, we're not really great or much different than animals. You know, some other things have, uh, um, maybe we are even worse than animals in some ways because we know better. We have other resources for dealing with each other and we choose not to use them. And we choose violence instead of bonding and relating, which is also available to us. So natural disasters creates dislocation on all levels. That's always been one of my topics of interest, you know, tracking what happens to um, climate not climate, sorry for the misspelling, climate migrants and refugees, people were forced out of their countries. I um, I have been in Italy for a couple of years before returning to the US and uh, been there in the south, in the islands where um, the, the migration is so overwhelming and uh, and and dealing with, with having to share resources, even in a country that doesn't have that that has a lot of resources, but they're not well distributed or managed, uh, really creates a lot of um, moral and ethical dilemmas, even for the churches who are invited to open their spaces. And uh, they all of a sudden put up all their racism. Um, and because the, the, the fear of not being able to survive kicks in. And so that you know, brings to the vulnerability of the poorest to trafficking and exploitation in every form. And the core of our work to look at what happens spiritually is that we develop despair. And despair never leads to good things. So this is the call, the call for us 
through information. So what do we do when we know all of these things? I choose to be educated on the, on on these things and to educate others. But all of us can be involved in collaborating and dialogue and continuing to 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 be involved in community in communities that are already working on this and advocating for more justice, ecological justice and care together. So as I said in the beginning, I might not be able to satisfy what, whatever objective you came or whatever intention uh, you brought to this um, to this hour. But what I wanted to do was really to share with you what I've been on the journey and what I hope to develop, I will develop for the course. <laughs> so um, I, I see that there are some, uh, yeah, some sharing here in the chat. Thank you for that. And I know that we are out of time, but it is imperative that I come back to the circle here, or to the square, to see where everybody is and to hear if there is any comment or question that I can take with me to develop for the course, anything that you think should be priority. that I would use your gift to, to develop in the course, like any... One of the things that flagged for me was when you were talking about the living human document, which I think is also, there's a pedagogy that goes along with that, the CPE, I think, um, and talking about embedding that within kind of the wider ecosystem. And so I just, I'm, I'm really interested in that as both a pedagogy, maybe for a course, but then also as, I wonder if, if that kind of work of, of, I guess, I understand living human document is about sacred listening, about holding stories, and about looking at them with kind of pastoral and critical light. I just, that really struck me, setting up, of, of expanding that living human document. And thinking about that as both pedagogy for a course, but also I wonder if that's a way in which churches can begin to enter into these spaces and, and dwell in, in this place that's very, very overwhelming. But I wonder if, if that's like a rooted, grounded way to, to get into all this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any last comment or question, reflection, thought? I'm sorry, we're running a bit over time, but if you can spare another couple of minutes and, and be and offer the gift of your thoughts. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for this class. This was very enlightening. Um, and I was just wondering, is there like a follow-up? Um, I know this is probably meant for your students, but um, <laughs> as someone that's interested in in becoming more of an advocate for this type of thing, how can how can we kind of follow up? Wilson, do you want to take that? <laughs> yes, yeah, so if uh, for one follow up um, is if you would like to audit the class, um, it's being offered in November, so the class on caring for ourselves, caring for our planet. Um, you can contact our director of admissions, uh, Stephanie Moon, which is smoon at flexio.edu. Um, also, there is a green task force at LTS, and these kind of issues are a central part of the commitment of a lot of us here. So there are other continuing education and worship opportunities to connect to this. Any questions? I understand that maybe my audio is having problems. Mm. It just has a little echo. Well, I hope that you will all join me in thanking Professor Nunes for this blessing of the class, for doing this, for holding this space for bringing your pastoral and scholarly brilliance to this pressing question, and for finding all these different paths for us to engage. I'm, I'm deeply grateful for what you have done for us in this hour today, for what you're going to continue to do for the LTS community, 
Um, a recording of this uh, session will be emailed out to folks. And please, uh, and, and, and please, uh, I also invite you to, to share your thanks in the chat. And thank you all so much for being here at this Lake School of Theology.